fantastic start of the day with our panel, and I would like to invite our uh, first uh, standalone presenter today, Ray Scott, of the Space Specialists. Um, and Ray will be talking about personal, personal insights into space robotics and space exploration. Ray, the stage is yours. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be in London. Isn't it nice? Finally, we get to see each other. So today, I'm going to give you some personal insights into space robotics and space exploration. I've been very fortunate in uh, my 30-year career in the industry to uh, get involved in this diverse field. So, yeah, it's a fantastic pleasure to be here in London. And also, welcome to all of our guests online around the world. And hopefully, you'll gain some insights into this fascinating world of space robotics and space exploration, what's going on. Okay, so make sure we can do that. Sounds good. There we go. So, really, the, today's uh, 15 minutes is a personal insight into space robotics. What's it all about? Of course, linked to space exploration. And uh, thank you for listening. Bit of background about me. Um, I started off at uh, Loughborough University, and I was very fortunate to get a sponsorship uh, through British Aerospace, commonly known as Airbus Stevenage UK, one of the world's leading manufacturers of satellites. So this is my career. Um, I've been very, very fortunate to travel the world, which has been great, and uh, got some good experience there to showcase to you today. So if you have any questions, please uh, follow around. And I've also been very fortunate. I have a passion for languages, ever have since I was at school. And with the space sector, I've been able to add those. So I'm a very strange Brit. I speak six languages, and actually some of those pretty badly sometimes as well. So it's a really great pleasure to actually be able to do that. So who's space specialists? Uh, we're a small company. We're growing. And uh, we offer four services recruitment, training, consulting, and we also have our Space Mates online. You can check our website, it's uh, spacespecialist.com, and we've just recently added a new one, spacespecialisttraining.com, and we're bringing online training, uh, obviously, with the COVID situation. We're based in Cheshire, uh, there's Chester for you, and we also have an office in Australia, in the uh, fantastic city of Adelaide, a bit of a hub now for space. And I went to the IAC in 2017 and saw the opportunity that the agency was going to be formed. So yes, Australia, down under, great things are happening. Every week, if you haven't got the chance to be working, come along every Tuesday. We host Spacemates Online. It's a great way to network globally in the industry. We have guests, so if anybody is here, please check our stand out. We'd love to have you and interview you. Anything to do with space, it's all about allowing serendipity to happen. There's some examples of some of our previous guests. We have lawyers, we have people involved in Earth observation, people who have a passion for space. So uh, check it out, it's all on our blogs. Uh, but I'd like to inspire you today to think of a three-acronym uh, new word for the space sector. F-I-E, fascinate, inspire, and excite. And it's not just robotics and exploration. The whole industry is going through these three phases. Why fascinate? Well, I was four years old, and I was fascinated by space robots, the classic science fiction robots, that, what they mean to me. You know, whether it's WALL-E or whether it's, uh, you know, Star Wars, you know, these are the things that come to mind when you think about space robots. Okay, some a little bit older than others, uh, showing my age, a lot older, if you can see some of those pictures. And some of our younger generation today probably have some fantastic uh, new robots that I'm probably not even aware of. So what is a robot? Actually, it's quite difficult to define, but it has elements of control, it has elements of sensors and actuators. This one, for example, can go on ice, maybe can explore around various moons of around Jupiter or Saturn. They have a capability to compute or have machine learning, but also they have a locomotion and a method to move around. So we're all familiar with the space shuttle, we all know the Canada, what a successful program. Well, I was very fortunate to go to Canada to work on the International Space Station, and there working with the astronauts and cosmonauts, working on a very big robot called Dexter. Dexter stands for Dexterous Manipulator. It has an acronym, of course, because the space industry is absolutely full of them. It's called SPDM, with a special purpose Dexterous Manipulator. Basically, it's a very big robot, 
about the height of this room with very big arms that does maintenance on the International Space Station. And what I was involved with was getting that program running, getting the ops people going, but also delivering that hardware to NASA and allowing astronauts more actual time in space as opposed to actually doing the dangerous spacewalks and uh, doing all the preparation and depreparation, as we call it, very technical language. But here you see a simulation of the cupola on the International Space Station doing a robotic task with one of the visiting uh, transfer vehicles. There we have an outside shot of the cupola delivered to NASA from ESA. Amazing bit of kit. What did we use? We used a robot arm to put it in place. So robotics are essential for space in low Earth orbit. And um, here we are. There's an old view of myself working on what's called the robotics workstation. This is how we control the robot from computers, with software, with very clever algorithms, actually. That's what's developed over the last few years. And this is the view an astronaut or cosmonaut would have inside the cupola, being able to see that sensory perception, that situational awareness outside the vehicles, but also having the skills, the training, to actually work on robotics. So here you can see uh, SPDM Dexter, as it's called, is a dexterous robot. So that's what it does. The big arm, Canadarm2, Canadarm2 moves big stuff around. Dexter moves the smaller stuff around. So it could be an experiment, and it could be some exchangeable units, which you call in the business orbital replacement units, or ORUs. So we've got to think about that, because as we go into the solar system, as we go into space, how are we going to change things to make sure things are robotically compatible, that we can change things out? We've got to think about that, because if we don't, we spend an awful lot of money to get that into space, we can't actually use it there. So here's some really nice pictures of the outside of the ISS, the International Space Station, with various big arm or small arms being used on the vehicles there. And of course, astronauts are involved as well. We move astronauts around on the Hubble platform. Uh, we've also been doing lots of training. Famous astronaut Chris Hadfield had the great opportunity to work with him, Canadian, of course. And there he is, uh, head of the astronaut corps at the time, and deployed the Canadarm2, a large, big arm, as we call it, that is able to actually pick up the space shuttle. Think about that. It's actually able to bring the space shuttle to a berthing on the International Space Station. Uh, so it has a very big uh, capability. They use the pool, uh, their underwater tests, and also Europe's been involved in space. In fact, this year, we finally launched the European robotic arm. It is on the Russian segment. It's going to be doing useful stuff by moving experiments inside and outside the space station, the Russian part. And it's built by Dutch Space, or EADS Dutch Space now, in the Netherlands. And that arm... What a history. It was originally designed to go on the Hermes space plane. Do you remember that? Kness, long time ago, tried to put a Hermes a space plane on the top of an Ariane 5. That arm was designed to use it. 40 years later, it's finally been launched into space. And uh, my involvement was getting the crew trained, getting involved in some of the aspects of the crew training in Star City in Moscow. Here you have Andre Kuipers with the Orland spacesuit. And this is the vehicle it finally went up on, NAUCA, or the MLM, the Multi-Purpose Logistics Module. Lots of acronyms, of course. Here we have the final integration, uh, some great shots of that. And, of course, it docked, and we all know it docked because it turned the space station upside down a few times with some remote thruster firings as well. So here we dock. This is automatic docking. So the actual... Now, the module is also a robot. Why? Because it has sensors, it has actuators, it has a brain, it has a computer, and it senses its environment. And of course, this is a really big piece of kit and uh, a very delicate task to birth that large module to the International Space Station. And of course, the astronauts, cosmonauts can take over control. So there's this talk about autonomy or autonomous or semi-autonomous control. And this is very important in robotics because we're really developing the capabilities to move ahead with semi-automatic or automatic or manual control. It's getting crowded up in space. We have all of these very interesting people up there, not just career astronauts. You know, we have 
Film crew, they just come back. It's amazing. You know, we, the number of flights up to the ISS now. Uh, so poor old uh, Tom Cruise got beaten to the post by a Russian uh, star actress. And uh, these robots are moving things around the, all the time. So here's the airlock being moved around. We also have a Robonaut. You may have seen this. Robonaut was developed by NASA also to complement Dexter. It's more humanoid and looking at the way we can use existing... Coding, coding. Uh, we also have personal assistant robots, top left, cute robots, and uh, strange robots, bottom right. Astronaut exoskeleton, so we can control the robot also with our own bodies. So we can actually have uh, the control very similar to what we would have as a human. And this is a test that we did in the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, in Germany, uh, to try and understand what we could do to build up a robot from scratch. And we wanted to understand what we could do on the station, moon, and Mars. Now, when we talk about robots we're all familiar with, Mars, the rovers, the little rovers. We've progressed now. We've got bigger rovers. We've got large rovers. We've got static vehicles. They're all robotic devices. Okay, here's some great shots of the current Perseverance Mars rover on the planet. And there you actually see the flight hardware. Amazing bit of kit. And here it's doing its job of looking for early signs of uh, potential bacterial life or previous life on Mars. Uh, Perseverance has landed in Jezero Crater. I learned that this uh, last summer. It's not Jezero, it's Jezero. These are some of the things you learn in the space industry. It's an amazing industry to be in. And once the uh, Perseverance rover has picked up some samples, it's going to leave them on the surface for another rover called a Fetch rover that's being built and designed by our guys in Stevenage. They have some robotic stay, uh, plans there. So we have a fetch rover, and it's going to come back to an orbiter, and then it's going to actually come back and bring those samples to Earth for analysis. So this is what we're seeing. So through our robot eyes, we are seeing Mars. It's not simulation. Um, we have helicopters. We're learning now that the atmosphere of Mars is so thin that sometimes we can't spin those helicopter blades fast enough because... It's a difficult environment, the cold and the vacuum and the environment. And we're in this big crater, and we're looking around to see what happens. And even Boris Johnson is looking at our rovers. Isn't that great? We have the political will now to fund our robotic programs in the UK and also around the world. It, great projects for students. The UK SEDS organization in the UK and around the world have challenges where they're looking at different robotic devices for different applications. And a lot of great ideas come from the students. Why? Because uh, big industry, smaller industry, we're off on our journey for space exploration. So we're off to the moon, are we? Are we off to Mars? Let's have a look. We've been to the moon, and uh, we've obviously had a good time there, apparently. What's the next step? Well, these are the types of rovers and landers, robotic devices that are going to be on the moon soon. So we're going to have a lunar economy. That economy will be built with humans and robots on the surface of the moon. We're going to have freighters. We're going to have transport. We're going to have Starship. Uh, this has been of an old picture now, but you know, we're going to have a moon base. We are. Actually, I'm going to put a bit of a stick in the sand today. I say that by 2027, we're going to be on Mars, and we're going to be on the moon beforehand. Why do I say that? We're in such a disruptive time, it's so exciting. And that's the E for the exciting bit that I'm going to come on to. We've got designs to get large payloads onto the moon. We have astronauts and robots working together. How do we do this? We've got to work all this out. So, you know, plug and play, reusing robots. Um, the space station has got a further development. It's called the Lunar Gateway. That's now being built right here in the UK. Big money going into...
Again, it's a robotic vehicle. A satellite is a robot. Okay? Lots of launches happening. I've been very fortunate to go to various launch sites. In fact, you could class a launcher as a robotic device. So the deltas, these are the projects that I've been very fortunate to work on. You've probably seen Ariane 5, big launch coming up, which is the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's going to be launching from French Guiana as well. We also have horizontal spacecraft and space planes, the Skylon from Reaction Engines. Again, robotic, unmanned vehicles. We've got unmanned vehicles going up on rockets, coming back down autonomously after a year and a half in space. We've got small space planes being developed around the world. We've got satellites. Satellites are robots. Uh, big satellites, small satellites, telecommunication satellites. These are some of the projects that I've worked on in my career. They're getting really big in geostationary orbit. But they're also getting really small, small satellite constellations. As a lot of our colleagues have said this morning, satellite constellations are the way to go. You know, CubeSats up to 500 kilograms, Small mission may be lasting for about four to five years. These robotic devices can also be deployed from the International Space Station. So you have a, a space station deploying a robot. OneWeb, lots of satellites, mass production. Interesting concept. I worked on the Global Star satellite constellation. We produced 64 of them, mass production of satellites, launches happening almost every other month. We have new developments of robotic devices in Earth orbit. We've got deployments. We have robotic devices going to do space exploration. Here's the Jupiter icy moons going to the planet Jupiter. And there's the large uh, satellite it is. And we also have in December the James Webb Space Telescope. I was very fortunate to work on one of the instruments for the James Webb Space Telescope. It's an imaging device. It operates at 7 Kelvin. And that imaging device is called MIRI, or Mid-Infrared Imager. And that's been developed and designed by a famous prior, um, personal investigator from uh, Scotland. And that is now ready for launch in French Guiana. Uh, it's going to be developed over the next uh, month or so and ready for launch. Here are some of the, the inner workings of this. You could call this potentially a robot. It's just been delivered on this ship to Kourou in French Guiana. We've had probes also exploring the solar system, the Venera probes to Venus. We've looked at asteroids and comets, the Rosetta mission with Philae, amazing. Philae lander bounced onto the uh, comet and uh, asteroid. We've also taken samples. We're waiting for them to come back, and also some samples have already come back from the moon and from different uh, asteroid devices. We've also had the Huygens probe. This went to the Titan uh, uh, moon and also landed on the moon of Saturn. Amazing. And there's the shot actually from the surface of the moon. What's going on in the industry? We have a lot of competition at the moment. Elon Musk is busy. He's launching robotic devices, robotic vehicles coming back, automatic launching. It's almost a week. Every week, there's a launch of a Falcon 9. Great shots of this, but it's becoming really routine. We have Starship, which is really going to change the game. And this will really revolutionize our understanding of how to move big amounts of stuff into low Earth orbit. But occasionally, it goes wrong. And of course, we have a vision. We actually have a new area, which is called Starbase in Boca Chica in Texas, which is fantastic. This is the future for the human race. This is how we're going to go to the moon, how we're going to go to Mars. And this is the vehicle that's going to do it. And that's what I put my money on, that by 2027, we're going to get there. And it's inspiring people. Look at the 3D printing that we've got. Look at the astronauts going up. It's becoming fun. We've got capsules. We've got inspiration. We've got dragons. We've got lots of things happening. The space station is getting busy. We need space control in terms of not air traffic control, uh, but space control. But these are some of the visions that we can think are going to happen in the future. Of course, Richard Branson's busy. We have robotic devices and space planes. We have the debate about astronauts, passenger astronauts, but we also have some inspirational people flying as well. So there's an amazing change that's going on in the industry. The change isn't just in robotics, but it's in human space flight as well. And these space stations, these shuttles, these robotic devices 
are going to happen this decade. China's busy. America's busy. Europe's busy. We have big space stations happening right in front of our eyes. They're being built every week. Satellites are going up. Rockets are going up. Oh, and by the way, looks very similar arm to the Canada Arm 2. That's the Chinese one. So what's the future for space robotics? Well, there's lots of stuff out there, lots of innovation, repair of satellites, extending the life of satellites, removing junk from orbit, decommissioning satellites, gas stations in space, refueling in space, landing on moons, like drones and robots working together, underwater robots, submarines, robotic devices that help us explore the icy moons of the Jupiter or Saturn moon system. And also lots of innovation is happening in the UK. There's an organization called Fairspace looking at AI, robotics, and looking at what we do in low Earth orbit and also around the solar system, the technology. Lots of things are happening. And uh, this is um, uh, really happening in, in our lifetimes. Uh, sensors are improving. Uh, machine vision's improving, and these things are changing the way that we're going to explore the solar system. So these things will become very apparent, and they're in our lives daily. Designs from students, building robotic farms, helping astronauts simulate and train on the ground to go into Mars and the moon, building a Mars base, building a moon gateway. These are all aspects of building the infrastructure to get out and explore the solar system. I'm just going to skip through a few of these. So what about future space exploration? We have Artemis. It's the NASA program. It's over budget, big time. We also have the vehicle. It's almost there, but it's not quite there because it had some fuel problems recently. We have visionaries. This guy's going around the moon in a couple of years' time with a whole bunch of people on a SpaceX vehicle. We're going to go to Mars. So Inspire is a very key part of this, inspiring the youth. We've just had the Women in Space uh, celebration of World Space Week. We've got amazing people that have challenged the paradigm. We need women in the UK space sector. Please come along board and do this. We need more representation. Diversity is really important in the industry. We need women speakers. We need you up here on the platform. Come and join us. Get into the industry. It's amazing. We have Chinese astronauts, Taikonauts. We also have the development of also online um, skills and facilities to actually meet online because of COVID. We're relearning how to engage. This is an online portal where you can go and visit an exhibition online. It's great. You can showcase what you're doing. Very similar to this, bigger scale, and it's permanently there. Go and check it out. There's lots of these things. There are inspirational people in the industry. A young guy, 26, building an asteroid mining corporation in the UK. A young man from Algeria, building a satellite for Africa. A young man from the Newcastle, getting into space law. And a young lady from Europe, who's in the downstream, as we call it, building data from satellites or robots in space. So the final thing I'd like to say is excite. We need to excite the youth, excite our existing audiences, it's here. This is London. This is where we are. This was on the screens in London. It's happening. Kids are engaged. Inspire, excite, fascinate. These are the things that we need to do. It's amazing stuff. Look at the technology. Who can't be wowed by those pictures? The video that we get back from Mars, landing on Mars. This is Mars. We see Mars every day now. It's not just us, it's all around the world. It's in the United Arab Emirates with the Hope spacecraft, amazingly successful, with the Chinese going to the moon and to Mars as well, testing their robotic devices and successfully landing on Mars. We've got new techniques of nuclear propulsion, new ways of farming. What's going to happen with robots versus humans? We're going to find out. And these are some pictures I'd just like to flick through towards the end, showcasing some visions of what we're going to do on the moon, maybe, what we're going to do on Mars. And I'd just like to say that these things are possible. Why am I here today excited? Why am I inspired? Why am I passionate about this? I've had a very interesting journey myself. This is going to happen, and it's happening faster. There's a tipping point, and we are on the breadth of a revolution of robotics in low Earth orbit. 
we're going to the planets, we're going to build cities on Mars, we're going to build orbital infrastructure, and this dream of science fiction is going to happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Any uh, questions from our audience? Ray, anyone? This is a question from Mark. Uh, do we need an uh, uh, intergovernmental body to control and collect space objects or a joint venture of uh, a lot of states? It's a very good question. Um, it's surprising to realize that we don't have any laws to stop polluting space. Now, why should we focus on that? Actually, we don't have any laws to stop polluting the oceans on Earth. How long have we been sailing the high seas? We need the coordination between not just governments, but we need a, 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 a ground resource push to protect our environment. If we can't get into space because of orbital debris, when a small fleck of paint will actually kill an astronaut or cosmonaut and something else like that will destroy a satellite, we're going to create barriers to go and do this exploration that I'm explaining about. We need to protect our environment. So we need responsible, we need ethical, and we need laws and penalties and responsibilities when you don't follow that. The unfortunate thing is, everybody says we should do it for space, but can I just say, why haven't we done it for the oceans and we've been sailing the oceans for a long time? It's strange that we can still pollute the oceans and there are no laws on the high seas. Right.